हेलो मैम वी आर लाइव वी कैन स्टार्ट मैम यस यस पद्मानंदन सर स्टार्ट प्लीज या गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आई आई टी तमिलनाडु आई वेलकम ऑल दी फैकल्टी डेलीगेट्स फॉर दिस मंथली आई आई टी टीएन एकेडमी मीटिंग this meeting is on psoriasis and uh, papulous squamous, squamous disorders we have uh, great lists of faculty in our uh, meeting today i am uh, thankful to dr maya madam for getting an international speaker for today's meeting so let's start the meeting first i invest i invite our uh, adltn academy chairman dr v anandan sir to give the welcome note Dr. Anandan sir, please. Dr. Badma Anandan, thank you for inviting me. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a great pleasure to address as uh, the chairperson or the chairman of TNI ADVL Academy, which was given permission in the last AGBM a month ago. Within a month, we were able to materialize, get solidified, to get two international speakers. One is from USA and one from India, which says without going. it is our mutli dar rajagopalan so it was all uh, possible because of uh, our uh, enthusiastic uh, uh, co chair person and uh, the convener of academy dr tn uh, nirmala devi that is pn nirmala devi and uh, uh, dr ani flora who was working continuously to get it uh, into a reality so uh, as a chair person i would like to recall that uh, last month a uh, permission was given for this academy with a chairperson co chairperson and a convener and to start with uh, four uh, special focus groups one is papular squamous uh, another is uh, aesthetic third is our uh, uh, if i'm right it is mycology and third is our uh, as, i mean the last is the psoriasis group so it is subject to verification for the last two groups so here we are kick starting today an auspicious day with an international speaker uh from USA who is going to talk on uh psoriasis what and the best what is the best type what is the best drug so many things we are going to get enlightened followed by our uh, uh international speaker and a well known uh personality in uh, India Dr Murlidhar Rajagopalan and that is going to be followed by our panel discussion headed by uh, dr tareos which is going to have uh, a group of eminent people senior people to be in the panelists and i take this opportunity to thank our uh, president maya vedamurthy madam without whom this international speaker us speaker uh, would have been difficult to get into this uh, stream and i also thank dr badmanandan for uh, Uh, continuously working for the success of this program so with this we all get into the opening ceremony of tni advl academy along with the uh, tni advl uh, to kick start the first uh, program on papular squamous disorders so here we go welcome all and i hand over the mic to the master of ceremonies dr badmanandan to proceed further if i have let everybody it is not intentional so consider that everybody has been mentioned in my note thank you thank you sir dr badmanand thank you sir now it's time for our uh, president iadvl tamil nadu for the keynote address i welcome dr maya vedamurthy ma'am thank you dr padmanand and thank you dr anandan for your kind words good evening respected professors seniors dear colleagues and friends a warm welcome to one and all for joining us on a sunday evening Today, I am happy to say that Tamil Nadu IAD will is launching its monthly meeting series. Our aim of this monthly meeting is to impart high-quality professional education on a digital platform to meet the demands of the new normal. Our dream is to make Tamil Nadu the mecca of dermatology, as we have highly qualified and reputed dermatologists across entire Tamil Nadu. We decided to start the monthly CME series with eczema and papular squamous disorders. in lieu of the upcoming world psoriasis day for this we were fortunate to have a well known ad speaker from the united states dr jayshin wu to speak on psoriasis 
followed by our own international expert, Dr. Murli Dar Rajkopal, and then a panel discussion by the best of our experts with Professor Tades as our moderator, Professor Anandan, Professor M. S. Srinivasan, Professor Geeta Rani, Professor Kavi Elson, and Professor Ram Sami as our esteemed panelists. I sincerely thank our executive committee, spearheaded by Professor Anandan and ably assisted by Professor Nirmala Devi, Dr. Padmanandan, and Dr. Annie, who worked tirelessly to make this program possible for us today. Our special thanks to Dr. Reddy's for helping us with this venture. Our sincere thanks to Mr. Balasubram, retired Doordarshan newsreader, for translating the educational leaflet on psoriasis from English to Tamil. And this will be made available soon for all our members for use. We understand that there is plenty of room for improvement. And to reinforce our mission, we welcome suggestions, topics, and speakers for forthcoming CMEs. The power of Tamil Nadu IAD will comes from each and every member. Be a part of the future of dermatology in Tamil Nadu. With this request and hope, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Padmanandan. Happy learning, and thank you all once again for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now it's time for a little promo video on uh, bid from Team Chennai for uh, Dermacon 23. of IADL Tamil Nadu, I request all of you to support the Team Chennai's bid for uh, Dermacon 23 and vote in large numbers. Now, before the next session, an uh, introduction of the small introduction of the speaker, Dr. Jashin J. Wu. Dr. Jashin J. Wu is a founder and post director of the San Diego Dermatology Symposium, which was held in this month, that is September 11th to 12th. He is the founder and CEO of the Dermatology Research and Education Foundation. In his 15 years of clinical practice, he has treated more than 1,500 psoriasis patients, of which over 1,000 received oral agents, biologics, and or phototherapy. He is a past medical board member of the National Psoriasis Foundation and a counselor for the International Psoriasis Council. His services on American Academy of Dermatology and, uh, and Psoriasis Guidelines Committee, which published updated psoriasis guidelines in 2019-20. He is a co-editor for a textbook on psoriasis. He is Associated Editor for fourth edition of Comprehensive Dermatological Drug Therapy published on March 2020. He has written over 3, 350 PubMed articles, of which over 250 are about psoriasis. 
He is a past president of the Los Angeles Metropolitan Dermatological Society, board member of the California Society of Dermatology and Dermatological Surgery, and uh, board member of the Pacific Dermatologic Association. Dr. Hu has given over 140 psoriasis lectures at medical conferences and dermatology departments in various countries. And uh, now it's time for the talk on talk by Dr. Wu. That is the topic is which psoriasis therapy for which patients. Understood? Yes, sir. Hey, Wu. I'm a dermatologist, and I'll be speaking about which systemic therapy for which psoriasis patient. So here are my potential conflicts of interest. So I'm sure many of you are cooped up at home because of the COVID uh, pandemic. So probably a lot of you are playing Fortnite. So you, if you're familiar with Fortnite, it's a game where people are trying to basically kill each other off. So there's lots of different weapons you can use. So it's kind of similar in the psoriasis space in which there's so many different agents to use now to treat our patients with severe psoriasis. In terms of biologics, there are 11 FDA approved biologics for psoriasis, which is uh, very high. I mean, that's, can't think of too many other disease processes where you have so many approved medications. And there's gonna be a couple more that will be, that will be approved in the next couple of years. There are also four oral therapies. And then there's also phototherapy. So there's narrow band phototherapy, which can be office-based, home-based, or an eczema laser, as well as PUVA, which is when you take a sorolin pill by mouth and then you enter a, a UVA box. So I'm actually not gonna be talking about PUVA because PUVA is really out of favor at this point. So how do we decide amongst all these different systemic agents to treat people with psoriasis? Well, I would say the simple way is actually just determining whether, which drug company do you like the most? <laughs> So who, best, who brings the best food and drink to your office if that's still allowed during this COVID pandemic? So do you like uh, Starbucks or do you like Seattle's Best Coffee? Or do you like Dunkin' Donuts? Or do you like Krispy Kreme Donuts? Do you like pizza versus sandwiches? Of course, I'm just kidding. So there's a few review articles that have been published in the last uh, couple of years talking about how to determine which treatment to actually use for these psoriasis patients. So I was lucky enough to publish this uh, article in the uh, uh, American Journal of Clinical Dermatology a couple years ago, and they invited me to do an update in this article. So that's going to be submitted to them end of this year. And Dr. Lebel had this nice series of articles from JAD just uh, recently, last year, talking about uh, which systemic therapy for which psoriasis patient. So really the elephant in the room is what to do with the psoriasis patients in terms of COVID. So that's what we're going to be talking about first. So how would I decide uh, which treatment options to use for a patient with psoriasis and active COVID-19 infection? So if you look at all the various guidelines, AED, uh, National Psoriasis Foundation, International Psoriasis Council, they all say something similar in that you have to discontinue any biologic or systemic immunosuppressive therapy if they're actively uh, infected with COVID-19 until they've recovered from COVID-19. So that's, that's pretty uh, straightforward. So say if they are infected and they still need treatment for their psoriasis because their treatment, their psoriasis is going to be flaring uh, once they stop those systemic agents, you can still use something like home uh, UVB or acetretin. So acetretin is not an immunosuppressive agent, so that would be a nice option for these patients. So just a word about uh, home phototherapy. So Clarify has a nice uh, home phototherapy device where they have a regular handheld device, but this connects through the patient's smartphone so that connects to the cloud, and then it will go onto uh, the computer. So you can actually chart uh, the patient's uh, therapies, their sessions, their, to their total time in the uh, phototherapy uh, uh, with the phototherapy unit. So it's really quite nice, actually. And so as you know, psoriasis patients tend to be on the younger side. They tend to be the 20s and 30s, 40s. So they're probably younger. They're probably going to be able to use uh, a computer-based or app-based uh, device like this. So this would be a nice option for these patients if they have active COVID disease. So what about uh, my algorithm for patients with psoriasis and are at high risk for COVID-19 infection, but they don't actually have COVID-19 infection currently? 
So again, I would still recommend something like home phototherapy for these patients. Obviously, when they're at home, they don't have to worry about uh, potentially getting the COVID infection. Um, and then again, acetrine would be a nice option for these patients. This is not an immunosuppressive agent. What about the biologics? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the data uh, about this, but Dr. Joel Gelfand at UPenn, he's put out, uh, published a nice series of three articles in JAD recently talking about these three different uh, biologic classes in terms of the risk of uh, getting an upper respiratory infection. So not talking about COVID infection per se, but COVID-19 is a res uh, upper respiratory infection. So this is uh, to follow his algorithm. So he showed that uh, using point estimates, looks like interleukin-23 inhibitors may be the least likely to have uh, to increase your risk for a, a respiratory infection. And then uh, TF inhibitors and interleukin-17 inhibitors may also be uh, reasonable options. They're slightly higher, at least numerically, according to his study, but they're not significantly more likely to, at least for TF inhibitors. And then interleukin-17 inhibitors, it looks like uh, it, they actually may have a higher risk of getting uh, upper respiratory infection. Uh, but I would really recommend trying to avoid methotrexate and cyclosporin. So these are true immunosuppressive agents. These really could increase the risk for, of developing COVID if they are exposed to COVID. So sargate arthritis is, of course, another important comorbidity in patients with psoriasis. Uh, this is a patient with uh, arthritis mutilans. So you can see that the joints are really disfigured here. It's really quite unfortunate. Once you have patients that come in looking like this, there's really not much you can do for them anymore in terms of uh, improving the, the, the deformity. So here's a list of all the different agents that are FDA approved for both psoriasis and sarc arthritis. So a permalast, uh, the four TF inhibitors that are approved for psoriasis are also approved for sarc arthritis. There's another TF inhibitor that's approved for only sarc arthritis that's not listed here, escolimumab. There's also ustekinumab, and then the two TF inhibitors, uh, segakinumab and ixakizumab, rodalumab is not approved for sarc arthritis. And then uh, gilsekimab is the first interleukin-23 inhibitor that's been approved for sarc arthritis as well. So this was a nice article that came out maybe about a year and a half ago uh, by the American College of Rheumatology and the National Stress Foundation. So they put out some guidelines as to how to decide to treat patients based on various uh, clinical scenarios. They had about six clinical scenarios. So I'm basing uh, my recommendations on that paper and also my own clinical experience. So in that uh, guideline, they recommended TAMP inhibitors would be basically first line for most clinical scenarios. Uh, I would say, now that the data has come out with some of the newer agents, 17 blockers in particular, they've had some nice uh, poster presentations showing that they may be slightly more effective than TAMP inhibitors for product, uh, prevention of uh, progression of disease as shown by x-rays for sarc arthritis. So I'd probably put them on par. So I'd put them as both first line if they have both psoriasis and sarc arthritis. Uh, Gilsekimab I'll also put up there pretty high. As I mentioned, it is very effective for psoriasis uh, and also was just recently approved for sarc arthritis. Usakinumab is also approved for both, but I would have to say it's probably a little bit more effective, more for the psoriasis component rather than the sarc arthritis component. And then uh, just to add at the end, so acetrine, cyclosporin, and uh, uh, phototherapy are usually not really uh, going to be that effective for sarc arthritis, so I'd probably avoid those agents. You're probably aware that patients with psoriasis are much more likely to have cardiovascular disease. Uh, they're more likely to have uh, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, uh, heart attack, strokes, cardiovascular death. Um, and I was lucky enough to publish this in JAD a couple years ago. We showed that those patients on a TF inhibitor were much less likely to have a major adverse, major cardiovascular event compared to those on phototherapy. Another article showed the same thing in terms of TF inhibitors versus methotrexate. Now, of course, these were a retrospective study, so the most we can say is a correlation. These are not clinical trials, so we can't say there's causality, but it seems like this is, may be the case has been shown in many other studies and other uh, study populations. So what this is my uh, treatment algorithm for those patients with psoriasis and cardiovascular disease. I would still recommend TM inhibitors based on those retrospective studies. Interleukin-17 inhibitors may also be a good option as well for these patients. Uh, Dr. Mehta, Nahal Mehta at the NIH, he's published some nice articles showing that Patients uh, with TAMP inhibitors and on uh, interleukin-17 inhibitors have an improvement in their atherosclerotic plaques. Uh, it was a small site, but they showed that about 20-some patients on interleukin-17 inhibitors had a more, uh, more of a reduction of atherosclerotic plaques compared to TAMP inhibitors. So, of course, that's a small study, but it's very encouraging. I would just like to note that I would probably avoid cyclosporin and acetrin in these patients just because cyclosporin can increase blood pressure and acetrin can cause dyslipidemia. So these are obviously not things you want to have in these uh, patients with cardiovascular disease.
What about psoriasis and uh, congestive heart failure? So this is actually a little bit different. So uh, in, in this case, uh, the major biologic classes of interleukin-17 inhibitors, interleukin-23 inhibitors, and usikinumab would probably be okay. I don't think there's really a concern about causing recurrence or worsening of, your, of the CHF. Uh, the one in particular to, be, to avoid would be the TAM inhibitor class. So this is uh, noted on the prescribing information. So they, this is contraindicated in patients with your class three or four CHF. Uh, but if you still want to give it to these patients, if they have uh, New York class one or two, an echocardiogram should be done beforehand, uh, and you should still avoid in these patients with an ejection fraction of 50% or less. But in general, I would say probably just avoid the TAM inhibitors in general. You've got so many other options for these patients. What about for patients with psoriasis and obesity? So as you're aware, patients with psoriasis tend to be on the B side. I'd say at least 40, 45%, maybe even 50% of patients will be obese. So there's really only one medication that's truly weight-based, that's infliximab, so that's 5 mg per kg a dose. Uh, you can actually push it as high as 10 mg per kg a dose, which I've done in the past for my obese patients. Uh, Usikinumab is a, kind of a, a pseudo-weight-based dosing, so if they're less than 100 kilograms, you would give them the 45 milligram dosing. If they're more than 100 uh, kilograms, then you can give them the 90 milligram dosing, which is double the dose and also double the cost, unfortunately. After this, I would consider the 17 blockers or the 23 blockers. Uh, these are extremely effective biologics. So even though the patients may be on the B side, uh, they still will have very good improvement of their psoriasis. So some of these agents, such as uh, rizinkizumab, an interleukin-23 inhibitor, they've shown that these patients uh, in their clinical trials, even though they're obese, uh, their improvement is not much less compared to those who are not obese. So a lot of these stronger, newer agents are really quite effective for even the obese patients. Uh, the ones I would avoid would be more acetretin, cyclosporin, and methotrexate. Uh, cyclosporin uh, has to be weight-based dosing, so I, you're supposed to uh, dose it on the ideal weight, but if you accidentally uh, dose it on their actual weight, they're going to be getting a mega dose of cyclosporin, which is really not good. And then with methotrexate, they probably will have fatty liver already because they're obese, and methotrexate obviously is not going to be good for the liver. So when I speak about psoriasis, one of the most common questions I get is about a patient with a history of uh, solid tumor. So say I've had a patient with a prior history of uh, colon cancer, breast cancer, what sort of agents should they be put on? So usually I tell uh, these, uh, I advise these dermatologists that these patients should probably, you'd probably have to discuss it first with the oncologist to determine how is their uh, comfort level on putting them on a biologic agent, for example. And then also the history of the, of the prior uh, solid tumor. So say if they had a breast cancer, was it just six months ago or was it 10 years ago? So obviously if it was like 10, 20 years ago, maybe it's not, uh, not such, a, such a risk to have them on a biologic. But still, if there's a concern, you may want to put them on something like acetrin, which we've mentioned before is not an immunosuppressive agent, or phototherapy, which is not going to be causing immunosuppression. If I had to pick one biologic in terms of uh, less risk for recurrence of their solid tumor, I would probably pick usikinumab. And the reason is because this has been out for a long time, uh, not as long as the TAMF inhibitors, but the TAMF inhibitors, uh, there's some study that seems to indicate maybe there's a slight increased risk of, uh, of solid tumors in these patients, but other studies also do not show increased risk. But with, these, with usikinumab, they've had the solar registry, which has been going on for almost a decade now. Uh, and this is, uh, they've not really shown that patients with a prior history of a solid tumor were going to have a higher increased risk of getting that recurrence of that tumor. Uh, as with some of the other scenarios, I'd probably avoid cyclosporin and methotrexate just because these agents are immunosuppressive agents. Maybe in theory, they would increase the risk of a solid tumor recurrence. What about non-melanoma skin cancers? Um, so in terms of melanoma, I would group that with the solid tumors. But what about uh, basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas? So again, I'd probably put acetrin at the top. And actually, this would be an added benefit in that it does seem to uh, improve the risk for uh, non-melanoma skin cancers. So this would be another reason to put this at the top. Again, with a similar thinking, uh, uh, usikinumab would probably put near the top as well. Uh, TAMF inhibitors, I'd actually put much lower down, just because if you look at the labeling, there is a risk of uh, uh, non melanoma skin cancers in the, in the label for these agents. And then again, I would avoid methotrexate, cyclosporin, and phototherapy. Obviously, phototherapy, maybe you increase the risk of skin cancers because you're getting the UVB there. What about a history of lymphoma? So again, this is another concern for uh, some patients. So again, you may want to consider acetrin or phototherapy, probably not going to uh, increase their risk for immunosuppression. Again, usikinumab, if I had to pick one biologic, I'd probably pick that one uh, uh, based on uh, the solar registry. 
If I had to pick, uh, avoid a, a particular biologic class, I'd probably avoid the TAM inhibitors. As you're probably aware, there's a, a box warning about lymphoma for TAM inhibitors. So that would probably be a bad option for these patients. And again, I would avoid cyclosporine and methotrexate just because these are immunosuppressive agents. So patients with psoriasis uh, tend to be on the younger side, as we mentioned. So sometimes you'll have patients who become pregnant when they're on therapies. So what would, uh, what would be the best option for these patients? So if they really need to be on something more than topical therapies, I would usually recommend something like sertilizumab or phototherapy. So phototherapy, that's, again, fairly straightforward. You're not going to have much of a, a systemic effect with that. Sertilizumab is a, a nice option for these patients in that it is, is missing the FC portion of the biologic. So there's really a minimal risk of active transfer of the biologic to the patient. And they've actually studied that in the CRIP study which was just published a couple of years ago. So they, they showed that in 16 uh, pregnant women, they really had minimal transfer of uh, sertilizumab into the, into the fetus at week zero, week four, and in the later time period. So this is really uh, quite a nice option if they have really severe psoriasis and or sarcoarthritis and they need to be on some sort of systemic agent to control their disease. Um, moving down a little bit on the algorithm here, uh, some other studies have shown that adalimumab and infliximab actually do have active transfer of these uh, monoclonal antibodies to the fetus. So I'd probably avoid these agents. And then for sure, I would avoid uh, methotrexate and acetrend. Uh, with old uh, FDA categorization, these are category X. So obviously you don't wanna have these on board for a patient who's pregnant. What about pediatric psoriasis? So, uh, not quite as common in, uh, in uh, patients with psoriasis, but certainly I have seen my fair share of, of kids with severe psoriasis. So usikinumab was just recently approved for age six and up. It used to be just 12 up and up, but just a couple months ago, it was approved for uh, year, age six and up. So that's a, a pretty good, good option just because the dosing is very good for patients. Obviously, kids don't like shots, and this is dosed uh, at week zero, week four, and then every 12 weeks after that. So it really minimizes the number of shots for these kids. Ixikizumab was also just approved recently for kids. Um, a little bit more frequent shots, week zero, and then every four weeks after that. Uh, Etanacep is still approved for kids uh, for age four and above. Uh, the shots are a little bit more frequent, frequent here for these kids uh, every week, so maybe not the best option, and maybe a little bit weaker than the other two biologics I mentioned earlier. Uh, I've actually used a lot of these other agents for uh, patients with uh, pediatric psoriasis. Um, that's a trend in cyclosporine you could still use. I have used in the past, and that was more in the early days when there was really fewer biologics. But since we've got so many nice agents that are actually approved now for this patient population, I'd probably avoid some of these on the lower uh, list here. Psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease, this is an interesting phenomenon. So it seems to be somewhat related based on genetics. Um, but certainly there are some biologics that are approved for both uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. That would be adalimumab and infliximab. So these may be a good option for these patients. Uh, Sertilizumab and usikinumab are both approved for Crohn's disease and psoriasis. So those would be a good option for those patients. Uh, just moving down to the bottom of the list, uh, in general, I would recommend avoiding interleukin-17 inhibitors if they have an active inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, in this clinical trials, it has been shown that these patients may have a flare of their disease if they're given one of these interleukin-17 inhibitors. So since we've got so many other fantastic agents, I'd probably just avoid this class in general for this patient population. What about psoriasis and lupus? So again, this is a kind of a rare uh, population. I've only seen a couple of patients like this. Uh, again, I'd probably use something like ustekinumab. Uh, I've used the methotrexate acetrend also in these patients. Uh, but the main ones I would probably avoid would be ATF inhibitors and obviously phototherapy. Phototherapy, obviously, you don't want to do for someone with lupus. The ATF inhibitors, the, the concern there is that maybe there's going to be a conversion about the ANA, or there's uh, some reports in the past that uh, ATF inhibitors may cause uh, lupus. So if they already have lupus, I would just avoid this, uh, both of those agents in this patient population. So what about uh, latent uh, tuberculosis infection? So this is another common question I get from many uh, uh, many uh, dermatologists I actually just got a question about this last week. So what should be done for these patients? So in general, they should still get prophylaxis of nine months of isoniazide. So that would be dosed uh, usually one to two months uh, before they start the biologic. So I would treat them with the isoniazide, 30, 300 milligrams every day for nine months. Uh, I actually try to push it a little bit sooner. I, I would start uh, two to four weeks before starting the biologic. And then they have to be put on uh, vitamin B6, 50 milligrams once a day. And then you have to check CBC with diff and LFTs every three months after that. 
So my treatment algorithm for these patients would be an interleukin-17 inhibitor or an interleukin-23 inhibitor. So it's really quite nice in that these are a really, really low risk for uh, TB reactivation. I would not be too worried. Uh, even with our updated AAD uh, SARIS guidelines that I was lucky enough to be part of uh, published last year, we do say now that if they're not considered high risk, you actually don't need to check a TB test every year anymore in those patients. So especially if they're going to be put on something like a 17 blocker or a 23 blocker, you may consider not even checking the TB test every year, especially if you're in a low risk area like Maine, for example. Uh, if you still need to put them on a TAP inhibitor, uh, you certainly can do that. Or use a Kenumab, uh, you can put them on uh, uh, the isoniazide first for about a month, and then you can start the medication. But you just have to make sure that they really continue with the isoniazide for the full nine months. I've had certainly patients where they started it, and then they stopped it maybe two or three months in because they were not, they were not aware they actually had to finish the full nine months. So in conclusion, uh, comorbidities is very common in patients with psoriasis, and so this is a, a major uh, way to determine which of these therapies to use in patients with psoriasis. Uh, COVID-19 is obviously a concern for nowadays because of, uh, uh, in, in terms of what treatment option to use for these patients, but there are also other considerations such as cirrhotic arthritis, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer history, infection history, and other uh, miscellaneous issues. I would like to encourage you to register for next year's meeting. Hopefully we can have a next year meeting live. Uh, hopefully uh, COVID will be done by then, but this is uh, the date for next year's meeting. It'll be at Hilton San Diego Bayfront. And I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. On behalf of IADVL Tamil Nadu, we thank uh, Dr. Wu for that uh, excellent presentation. It was uh, really interesting, like uh, <clears throat> the next session would be by Dr. Murlidhar Rajgopalan. The topic would be management of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis across the ages. Uh, I don't think uh, you need any introduction to our uh, speaker, Dr. Murlidhar Rajgopalan. He is... Uh, like uh, all across India, is a well-known speaker. He's a well-known speaker. He's a consultant at Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. Uh, before sir starts his speech, I'd uh, request Vishrut, please can you share that video? Vishnu? Dear IEDV lights, wanna come from Team Chennai, Team IEDVL. You all know that Chennai is bidding for the second consecutive time for Dermacon. We have had an opportunity long back in 2007 to have uh, Dermacon conducted in Chennai. It was about, it's about 15, more than 15 years uh, since we have had Dermacon at Chennai. So please give us an opportunity to have every one of you as our esteemed guest. Though it's going to be Dermacon International, our whole theme is going to be an inclusive Dermacon. Every unit territory, every state, every one of you will have a say in Dermacon International on all aspects, not only in scientific activity. Every one of your input will be taken into account and every one of you will be our esteemed guest. So please give us an opportunity to have Demacon conducted in a, the place called, the place like Chennai, which is the cultural capital of South India. All of us are waiting eagerly at International and Domestic Airport of Chennai, waiting for your uh, arrival. So please give us an opportunity to have the Dermacon conducted channel. Jai Hind. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Murida Rajagopalan to deliver his talk on management of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis across ages. Thank you I very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Padmanathan. And uh, thank you, IEDVL uh, Tamil Nadu. And 
uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Anandan, Dr. Maya. It's been great to do a program with all of you. And uh, I was very happy to hear Jashin speaking because we both know each other for a long time. So it was good to hear that. But uh, I'll be shifting to atopic dermatitis. And uh, if there are questions, we can uh, see why is this, what's the similarity. Now, when you give me a topic like uh, severe atop, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis across the ages, um, it's open to interpretation as to how you can uh, do this. Because when you say across the ages, either you can say in childhood and then in adulthood, or you can say over a period of time, how was the management changed? So I'm going to adopt the latter and I'm going to talk about how management has changed over a period of time and what, what, what was there in the past and what is there now. So if we knew what it was we were doing, it would not be called research. Now, this is one of the very famous quotations of Albert Einstein. And uh, there are a lot of areas that we don't know in atopic dermatitis. In fact, uh, there is a very big uh, conundrum of what is the connection between atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. So I'm glad that uh, Dr. Anandan and Dr. Maya saw it fit to combine both these lectures today. But we need a lot of research to find out what is it. But my focus today will be only on the management aspects and I will not be taking you through aspects on pathogenesis and other such things like that. Now, there are a lot of shifting paradigms in the treatment approaches. I would highly recommend this article to anybody who wants to read more about it. Uh, today, we know there is an interplay between the immune response and the skin barrier defects. And there are specific areas that are affected, like the cheeks, the folds, the elbows, the areas around the knee, the wrist areas. So there are specific areas that get affected and this is what defines atopic dermatitis. This one single picture shows you that it defines it. And this is a molecule of IgE, which in many cases of atopic dermatitis is elevated. However, not all patients of atopic dermatitis are IgE dependent. So you have a IgE independent atopic dermatitis. So there are two subsets. The disease burden is fairly serious. Uh, we are all aware of the atopic march where one starts with atopic dermatitis, goes on to allergic rhinitis, ends up with asthma. But what should we look at is the poor prognostic factors and uh, a fa family history uh, early onset in 60% of cases, it is uh, below the age of one year. Female gender tend to do worse and the atopic triad which uh, coexists atopic uh, uh, rhinitis and uh, asthma or extrinsic asthma. So uh, this atopic triad is a poor prognostic factor. One thing that we have noticed and we have seen is that you don't have to progress from atopic dermatitis to allergic rhinitis and uh, then subsequently asthma. That atopic march need not be a march in one direction. It could be like a patient has asthma and a normal skin, but later on develops severe atopic dermatitis. So the prevalence, if you look at it, is mainly in uh, children. And uh, what we are going to talk about is this blue segment of the pie chart, which is the moderate to severe type. But even in the moderate to severe type, some of the very basic treatments of atopic dermatitis do not change. Now, there are a lot of debilitating effects that impact day-to-day -day functioning. I do not uh, treat any patient or look at any disease unless I look at the quality of life of the patient. So we know that itching can affect sleep and uh, the frequent awakenings can affect growth and can contribute to the metabolic syndrome. The flares are persistent. Repeated skin infections occur. There could be other parts, components of the atopic march. Overall, the quality of life is impaired and that can lead to depression and decrease in work productivity, uh, decrease in absenteeism and uh, increase in absenteeism and decrease in presenteeism. So all this has to be factored when you are trying to use a medication or a drug or an approach to treat atopic dermatitis. Uh, now, you don't need to be 
shown atopic dermatitis, but for the sake of completion, uh, these are atopic Indian kids that I have been seeing. Um, you can see over here the cheek, how badly involved it is, and the child is quite sad. This is a subacute inflammation with uh, going into an oozing phase. You can see the denim organ folds over here and the severe inflammation of the face. And this is a very acute stage where there is weeping eczema on the entire face and even on the body. These are situations where the bleach baths, the saline compressors and all work and steroid antibiotic combinations work. But I'm not going to talk in detail about that. But what we are concerned about is that it should not go into this phase, which is the lichenification phase. Now, the lichenification phase is something in which uh, you find the entire uh, skin starts getting thickened. Now, this is what is happening in an atopic skin. You have, if you want to understand uh, treatment approaches, we need to realize that the basic problem is a disrupted barrier and an abnormal immune regulation or a immune dysregulation. So the immune dysregulation brings into play TH17, TH2, TH22, TH1, and, and uh, all these uh, major cells by T cell activation. Now, it is very easy to understand when you look at this, that uh, this is very similar to what is happening in psoriasis. Even in psoriasis, the barrier function is abnormal. In psoriasis also, IL-17 is coming into play. In psoriasis, there is an imbalance between TH1 and TH22. And as time passes and the profile of the T cells change and it becomes a predominant TH1 uh, disease, then you start getting lichenification of the skin. This diagram we'll see in uh, detail in a little, uh, in, a, in a few moments. Uh, the most simplest and easy treatment for atopic dermatitis is actually emollients and moisturizers. Many times uh, people just gloss through this. They could be used interchangeably, this term. There is a lack of consistency in their use in the literature. An emollient is actually an ingredient of a moisturizer. And xerosis is the most important disease feature for eczema. And therefore, we need moisturizing to control mild eczema. It could also form part of the treatment regimen and possibly prevent eczema flare-ups by reducing the dryness of the skin, decreasing the transepidermal water loss, and improving the comfort and reducing the itching. The moisturizing components are hydrophilic or lipophilic. Both are useful. There are humectants like urea, glycerol, and lactic acid. I still remember that 30 years ago, practically this is all that we had when I started practice. Um, occlusives are still being used like petroleum uh, jellies or petrolatum and mineral oil. Emollients have come in now like lanolin, uh, glycerol stearate, glyceride stearate, the soy sterols, these are all coming in. And then the new kid on the block are what we call as the prescription emollient devices. Now, this prescription emollient devices has come up because people have understood that there is a barrier defect and the barrier defect is because of the defect in the or decrease in the, in, uh, in the intercellular ceramides and sphingolipids. So this is uh, specifically targeted towards repairing that and it contains lipids spheromites, fatty acids, and natural anti-inflammatory agents like glyceritinic acid. So this is what we have now, and this is what is most widely prescribed in patients with atopic dermatitis. It is the, meant to be used on a continuous basis for atopics. Now, if you look at the Cochrane review about whether moisturizers are helpful, because uh, once in a while, you will find patients coming in and telling you that the, they don't want to keep using the moisturizer. They appear to have a beneficial effect. The extent of the effect varies. Only in a few studies did moisturizers produce a reduction in disease severity. So the moisturizer alone is not enough for producing a reduction in disease severity. There is no convincing evidence that it improves eczema when it is used alone. And moisturizers are safe, they prevent flares, they prolong the time to flare and reduce the amount of topical corticosteroids needed and also other topical active products that are needed. So classically, you will find 
atopic patients using moisturizers right through the day, a pH balanced uh, cleanser, and using uh, corticosteroids for a flare or calcineurin inhibitors uh, the rest of the time for the hot spots. The topical anti-inflammatory therapy predominantly consisted of topical corticosteroids. There is some background noise coming. Okay. Um, now, topical corticosteroids are of different potencies, but if you look at it to, uh, to, to, to deliver the results, the potential of unwanted effects like this, for example, is uh, clobitazole and triamcinolone and beta-methasone valerate. All this, by the time it starts producing a wanted effect, the unwanted effects take uh, pre precedence. And a mild one like hydrocortisone um, will also produce an unwanted side effect, but at the same time, it does not have the potential to improve the dermatitis significantly, especially if it is a severe dermatitis. So there are limitations and there are different potencies. We are all aware of this, the different six classes of corticosteroids. But the problem is, is if you're going to uh, allow patients to use corticosteroids over a long period of time, skin atrophy, barrier impairment, increased risk of skin infections, tachyphylaxis, and of course, corticophobia sets in very fast. Now, this is a very simple electron microscopy diagram, which I have shown where when triamcinolone is used, if this is the normal skin, which is, uh, you can see the stratum corneum shows multiple layers, probably a bit lichenified, but once triamcinolone is used, it starts producing atrophy, it alters the lipid lamellae, it also reduces the corneodesmosomes. And there's the tendency for rebound after discontinuation of corticosteroids. So one cannot depend too extensively on corticosteroids as the mainstay of management. That is why people looked at topical immunomodulators or the calcineurin inhibitors, which we are all aware work through the calcineurin calmodulin complex. The classic uh, inhibitors we have are tacrolimus and pimicrolimus. And of course, cyclosporin, which is used as a systemic drug, is also a calcineurin inhibitor. And all of them prevent the transcription of uh, cytokines like interleukin-2, interleukin-3, 4, and TNF-alpha, all of which are strongly pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, when we talk about managing atopic dermatitis, we need to talk about early intervention. So what is early intervention? Normally, uh, when people were using corticosteroids, whenever there was a peak of atopic dermatitis, they would use a conventional drug like a topical steroid or a systemic steroid or cyclosporin. Um, then it went on to, if there is mild erythema or if there is a hot spot, you use a steroid over there and then you achieve a control zone and wait for the next uh, uh, peak to come up. But uh, things changed with the, the induction of medicines like pimicrolimus and tacrolimus, where this is the typical eczema cycle that I'm highlighting over here. But when it comes to eczema management, there is the steroid rescue zone. Because once you start the patient on pimicrolimus, you can maintain the patient on pimicrolimus because there are no long-term side effects of the drug. And only if there is a peak in spite of it, you need to rescue the patient with a steroid. So TCIs are a fresh approach. Um, they lower the intracellular signaling and therefore the T cell activation. And there are no steroid side effects. Now, when you look at the mechanism of action of uh, pimicrolimus, tacrolimus, and corticosteroids, one important difference that you see is that all of them work on T cells and mast cells, which are major components of uh, the atopic problem and the basophils. But tacrolimus has an added advantage of acting on the Langerhans cell, which only a corticosteroid gives you. Now, action on Langerhans cell helps to control the innate and adaptive immunity. So relapses are much lesser if you're going to start your patient on tacrolimus earlier rather than later, which is why now, as of now, you find most atopics using tacrolimus. Pimicrolimus doesn't do much to the innate or adaptive immunity, but it is very useful in delicate areas of the body, like the face and in very young children. Unfortunately, corticosteroids will also work on fibroblasts, 
and um, uh, macrophages, which is why you get a whole lot of side effects of corticosteroids. The conventional systemic drugs we are all aware are steroids. Uh, steroids are best used only for a flare. Long-term dependence should be discouraged. Cyclosporin is used in a dose of three to five milligram per kg per day. Talking in great detail about this is like taking coal to Newcastle because I'm addressing Tamil Nadu dermatologists. Uh, azathioprine is one drug which is very useful in adults or adult onset atopic eczema. And it is worthwhile to do a TPMT test before you start your patients on azathioprine. Uh, but we must have a word of caution that even if the TPMT levels are normal, the patient may go into uh, bone marrow suppression through non-TPMT mediated pathways with azathioprine. Therefore, at least weekly or two weekly blood counts are a must. I have had patients in whom the uh, bone marrow suppression has hit me after six months of continuous azathioprine in patients with pemphigus. Methotrexate is a good drug, especially when there is lichenification, because it also has anti-proliferative effects. Mycophenolate morphetal is not a very popular drug, but I use it sometimes in patients of atopic erythroderma in combination with intravenous immunoglobulins. This is not a very popular form of therapy, but is definitely accepted. There is a role for antihistamines. Antihistamines, we must remember, not only reduce itching, but they also have the potential to regulate inflammation. The newer antihistamines like Belastin have potent anti-inflammatory properties. So it's worthwhile to use antihistamines to control the inflammation. But if you're going to use an antihistamine for the sake of itching, it is better to use a sedative antihistamine because when you look at atopics and especially atopic children, the sleep cycle is totally disturbed, as I told you earlier. And when sleep cycle is disturbed, they lose the REM sleep. When a patient loses the REM sleep, that is the first indicator that the patient is going to end up with a metabolic syndrome. And the last thing you want is an atopic with a metabolic syndrome. So these are pictures from the British Journal of Dermatology. A patient had a varicelliform eruption, uh, which is a viral disease but it was secondarily infected by bacteria. So we have to look at the role of bacterial infections in atopics. Now this very busy slide, I'll make it simple for you. Uh, normally there is a colonization of the skin by multiple microbes, but if the amount of staph aureus becomes more, then there is an enhanced staph aureus colonization, which reduces the microbial diversity and that worsens the ep epidermal barrier dysfunction. We'll have to have a separate session just on the skin immune system to understand how this happens. But unfortunately, this downregulates filaggrin and that worsens the barrier function further. It also releases proteases, which damages the skin. And the virulence mechanisms of staph aureus are also proteases, enterotoxins, um, the uh, delta toxins, the alpha toxins, and so on, so, so on, so forth, which are responsible for recruiting IL-31, which mediates itching and multiple inflammatory cells. So when this happens, when you have these inflammatory cells coming in, especially the interaction between dendritic cells, you have IL-4 and IL-13 coming into the picture, which worsens the entire barrier function of the skin. So I have put up this diagram and gone into it a bit in detail because there are four important cytokines, IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, and IL-17, which are going to play a role in atopic dermatitis management. And we need to prevent the enhanced staph aureus colonization in atopic dermatitis. And therefore, we may have to treat with antibiotics as and when necessary. Uh, we did uh, an expert consensus recommendation. This was from the Skin Allergy Society um, in the 90, 90, 2019. Uh, I, I was one of the people we, who led this project and we used the grade system for uh, recommending different treatments. Uh, this is in the IJDVL. You need to assess the patient, explain the uh, disease, Counseling is important and then classify into mild or moderate and severe. In all of the moisturizers, emollients, 
TCS, TCIs are absolutely important. But the second line therapy is when you go into cyclosporin, which may not be required for mild disease, but moderate and severe disease may require it. Third line would be for azathioprine, phototherapy, mycophenolate, methotrexate. The fourth line is biologics and aprimelast. And you need to maintain your patient on weekend topical corticosteroids like two days a week or TCIs uh, or maintenance phototherapy. There are several adjuvants like avoidance of triggers, use of moisturizers, using a sendit as a cleanser, oral antihistamines, control infection, and the psychosomatic approach for the patient. So there is another group which we need to talk about, and that is the, I'm going to come to the more advanced treatments because we've already spoken about the topical therapies, the emollients, we've spoken about the topical steroids, we've spoken about TCIs, and then we've spoken a bit about systemic steroids, cyclosporin. I find cyclosporin to be a phenomenally underutilized drug in atopic dermatitis, especially for controlling the flare. You can use cyclosporin without anything, any other problem. And one issue is that when it comes to pediatric patients, um, many times the pediatricians are a little upset when you prescribe cyclosporin to the children so that they are taking care of because a referral may come from a, pedi from a pediatrician. We must uh, make them understand that the clearance of cyclosporin in pediatric age group is much faster through the kidney than in adults. So if I was to uh, choose between cyclosporin in children versus cyclosporin in adults, I would choose cyclosporin in children and azathioprine in adults. Having said that, we have to look at the JAK inhibitors. Uh, JAK means Janus kinase. Uh, there are pan-JAK inhibitors. We will not go into it because we do not want to inhibit all the JAK enzymes. But tofacitinib has very well known. In fact, now it is available even as a topical preparation. This inhibits JAK1 and JAK3. And the most effective JAK inhibitor, which is useful in the treatment of atopic dermatitis as a systemic drug, is baricitinib. It blocks all cytokines which activate the atopic pathway. It's the most well-studied and promising molecules. There are a lot of other molecules that are being studied and they are in the trial phase. There are no conclusive results as yet in atopic dermatitis. So can we have a disease modifying strategy? For this, we have identified genetic markers. Now the development of the atopic march, the genomic and other biomarkers will have a lot of significance for future disease management. But we, in practice, we find that we are not able to identify or test for several of these biomarkers or the genetic markers. One thing that I would say at this stage is that it is irrelevant to do IgE levels repeatedly when you treat an atopic patient because it frankly means nothing. The biomarkers will allow us to identify a subgroup of patients who would have a benefit from a specific therapeutic and prevention approach. So this is how we can personalize the uh, precision-based medicines. Okay. So this is what I mean by personalized medication. And by personalized medication for atopic dermatitis, if you have the biomarkers to detect the subgroups, like say a subgroup where the predominant problem is skin barrier impairment, then you're going to go for skin protection compensation of filagrin. The, you, if there is a bacterial infection, you need to restore the antimicrobial peptides. That is where vitamin D and TCIs come into place. If there is say, for example, B cell activation, this does happen. And in severe AD, I have seen this happening. And I have used rituximab in some of the severe ADs to stop the uh, B cell activation. But we are not able to measure the B cell activation in many of our patients. Now, we are not able to measure T cell subtypes either. But if we are going to be making a wise decision in using a biologic for uh, treating atopic dermatitis, it will be better if we first identify this subgroup. Pruritus is extremely important and the itching of the skin can further worsen the disease and make it chronic. And over here, you have to block IL-31 and IL-31 receptors and also the H4 receptor antagonists. So fexofenadine, incidentally, is one of the very good H4 receptor antagonists. 
So serum IgE, I don't measure in all patients. We do not look for allergic sensitization in all patients. It is only for very specific patients. So now I'm coming to the last maybe five to 10 minutes of this discussion. Uh, novel systemic therapies. Uh, what do we need to fulfill the promise of a treatment revolution? Now, this was published in Faculty of 1000. Uh, this is where I want to repeat that diagram, which I just gave you a glimpse of earlier. We know about the barrier dysfunction. We know about staph, but this alone is enough to induce the interleukin-1, interleukin-25, 33, and the thymic stromal lymphopoietin, which activates epidermal and dermal dendritic cells or Langerhans cells. That leads to activation of the T subsets, and each T subset has a specific cytokine like a TH2 has IL-13, IL-4, and IL-5. TH22 has IL-22, and the other T subsets produce IL-23 and IL-12. So we have ustiquinumab that is being sold as Stellara, which can block IL-23 and 20 and 12. We have fezakinumab, which blocks IL-22 alone. We have mepolizumab, which blocks IL-5 and dupilumab, which blocks 13 and 4, and lebricizumab and trilocinumab uh, uh, prevents the epidermal proliferation. There is, of course, we mentioned that itching is mediated by IL-31, which acts on eosinophils. For that, we have nemolizumab coming up. In fact, the drug is already available, not yet come into India. And if there is pronounced B cell activation, they produce a lot of IgE. That is the only situation. If you are contemplating the use of omelizumab, you should measure the IgE levels. If the IgE levels are normal, omelizumab is not likely to be effective. Incidentally, I personally do not use omelizumab in atopic dermatitis patients because the benefit is very, very temporary. And in no time at all, the patient would have spent a lot of money only for the IgE levels to come back to where they were. Now, as far as baricitinib and the JAK inhibitors are concerned, they act at all these levels because the very transcription of these cytokines is dependent on the JAK stat pathway. So that is why ultimately I think in the next few years, we are going to be using a lot of baricitinib in our practice. It's there abroad, but I think it is not yet available. Um, one drug that has come into the market and uh, which will come into India probably in about three to six months time is dupilumab. It is important to understand this. Uh, we know that the Th2 cells interact with B cells, with antigen presenting cells. They interact with eosinophils and mast cells. Um, the B cells produce IgE, which can be blocked by Zolaire, but the IL-4 and uh, IL-13 is uh, the, when, when, when eosinophils get activated, it, it, it requires IL-13 because that is why people develop anaphylaxis or airway obstruction, urtic area or rhinitis. So dupilumab is one drug which blocks both IL-4 and IL-13. It is usually given in a loading dose of 600 milligrams, after which every two to four weeks, you may have to give 300 milligrams. So this can prevent eczema with the eosinophilic infiltration. It can improve the epithelial barrier. It can prevent the xerosis, and it can also prevent the action of the eosinophils on the blood. So it is there within four weeks, you can see an improvement. And uh, recently a paper was published in which they showed that the drug survival of dupilumab is up to two years in an atopic, which means when you give a patient the initial at least six months of dupilumab, you can expect that the patient remains at a low EC score or low score at score for up to two years. It suppresses mRNA expression in the lesional skin of genes. Uh, we saw that it restores barrier function. Problems are almost about 20 to 40 percent of the patients develop conjunctivitis, which is transient, which can be managed, but it can be disturbing to the patient. And like many biologics, injection site reactions, nasopharyngitis, and upper respiratory tract infection can occur. I did speak or touch about IL-31. This is a link between the T cells and itching in the atopic skin. 
And this is also the link between staff colonization, subsequent T cell recruitment, which I showed you, and induction of pruritus. So IL-31 has gained a lot of importance now. So IL-4, IL-13, and IL-31 are the three major important cytokines when we are talking about atopic dermatitis targets. So nemolizumab targets IL-31. It targets the receptor for it, and it amplifies uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion, disrupts epidermal barrier, and therefore nemolizumab helps to prevent that by blocking the IL-31. IL-31 also activates signal transduction, and nemolizumab improves pruritus, scorad, EC, and most importantly, sleep quality. One thing that has been observed is that there may be an occasional worsening of the dermatitis, but that is temporary. You need to counsel your patients when you put your patients on a drug like nemolizumab. There are two other drugs now, lebricizumab and tralocidumab. Uh, both of them work to prevent epidermal proliferation and both are IL-31. They reduce, now IL-13 reduces the epidermal barrier integrity um, in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, if we are going to use these drugs, there is a good improvement in the severity. Uh, utility of both these two drugs has been limited because of blunting of response by topical corticosteroids. What actually happened was that these patients in whom lebricizumab and tralicinumab were tried for regulatory guidelines, they had to be put on a topical corticosteroid also. And the corticosteroids major effect is in the epidermis and upper dermis. So uh, they have not been conclusively pre proven to be better than dupilumab because of this confounding factor. There are trials now going on to try and see whether lebricizumab or tralicidumab can be used against a control arm of a placebo or an emollient. But uh, it will uh, take time to get results of that. So when you look at systemic therapies, most of this I have spoken about, except mepolizumab, which is anti-IL-5. IL-5 activates eosinophils. Uh, I did tell you that I personally have used rituximab in severe atopics. Aprimelast is a topical, is, uh, is an oral tablet, and we know it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Uh, interferon gamma uh, can be used. We did speak about ustikinumab. Tocilizumab is famous today because of the COVID uh, issue, but it is anti-IL-6, and this once again prevents proliferation of epidermal cells. And one impo important drug, which we are all using anyway, is secukinumab. So if I have a patient, or if I give you a clinical situation, if I have a patient with palmoplantar psoriasis, and I'm worried whether it could be an eczema, and the biopsy is inconclusive, I would start the patient on secukinumab because it is going to work on both. So if you look at this one diagram alone, this blue line talks, talks about baricitinib and you can see the degree of improvement it has produced. Um, if you look at cyclosporin, there are, this is almost similar to baricitinib, but baricitinib does not have the serious side effects of cyclosporin over long-term usage. Dupilumab scores over this because it, it's much better than even baricitinib and cyclosporin, but baricitinib and cyclosporin are oral drugs. There are others like azathioprine, but azathioprine only can help you to a certain extent. After 12 weeks, it was stopped because of bone marrow effects. Uh, methotrexate can help to some extent, but only in the proliferatory phase. So this is one important diagram which I thought I will share with you. And one drug which I mentioned is nemolizumab, which is uh, IL-31. And you can see if you are able to block IL-31, there is a 40% reduction in the severity of the atopic dermatitis. But when you look at this diagram alone, which is not a company-sponsored uh, study, uh, the imp most important drug that has come in today is dupilumab. And I think uh, other than baricitinib, these two drugs are there to stay. Uh, the other phosphodiesterase inhibitor is crisoberol. Uh, this is also coming to India, maybe in another six months. It, is, it will be called as Ucrisa. Maybe for regulatory reasons, they'll change the name. Um, atopic dermatitis patients show a significantly elevated leukocyte phosphodiesterase E activity. 
Um, the consequences are increased elevation in histamine and IgE synthesis. Uh, Crisiparole has been approved. It lessens inflammation, relieves itching, and is an alternative to topical corticosteroids. So we can do away with corticosteroids if we are able to get access to crisoprol fast enough. So coming towards the last three or four slides, prevention of atopic dermatitis by early intervention. Probiotics have been touted. Once again, we don't have hard evidence to promote it. Potential contribution of vitamin D to, uh, to, in, in order to lessen allergic inflammation and corticosteroid insensitivity. Once again, the jury is still out. Uh, even though this article is in 2014, we still don't have hard recommendations to supplement vitamin D for atopic dermatitis patients. Controlling environmental peanut in the household, even if the patient is not directly sensitized to peanut or doesn't give you a history of peanut allergy, the environmental peanut increases the damage to the skin barrier and therefore reduces sensitization if you control it, okay? Protective effect of daily emollient reduces the risk by 50%. So this is how you can actually prevent AD by early intervention. So with this, I conclude. Probably this is the only time when you will see Kedarnath so peaceful. So I hope the talk has been useful to you in your practice. And if there are questions, I'll be very happy to take them. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, exhaustive and practical talk on management of atopic dermatitis. I think uh, most of the delegates would have uh, been immensely benefited by your talk in their practice, in implementing in their practice. I request you to join the panelists because we, we do have some questions, so you can take the questions during the panel discussion, sir. Sure. Now it's time for uh, panel discussion. Panel discussion on management of eczema and papular squamous, squamous disorders in <laughs> Indian scenario. The panel discussion is being moderated by Dr. Professor Dr. J. Thaddeus from Tutukudi Medical College. The we have a galaxy of uh, eminent speakers as panelists who don't need specific introduction. Dr. S. Anandan, sir. Uh, Dr. M. S. Srinivasan, who is also the president-elect of IADVL Tamil Nadu from Chettinad Medical College. Dr. G. Geetha Rani, professor in HOD from Madurai Medical College. Dr. P. K. Kaviyarasan, professor in HOD, Raja Muttaya Medical College, Chidambaram. And Dr. P. P. Ramasamy, a former professor at Koyamuthur Medical College and uh, currently practicing in Tirupur and also would be joined, uh, the panel would uh, comprise of Dr. Murlidhar Raj Gopal. I request Dr. Thades to take over the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction. And uh, on behalf of uh, the panelists and myself, we... Uh, we are very thankful for this uh, session. And the first question will be role of antibiotics in atopic dermatitis. Is Dr. Thaddeus video on? Uh, video, the audio is on, madam. Show yourself yes. also. <laughs> I'm sure they would all love video. to see you. Video. Meanwhile, I'll request all the delegates, if you have not uh, you uh, given your medical council registration number during the registration process, kindly mail it to me or you can WhatsApp to myself or Dr. Dr. Annie Flora, who is the convener for the Tamil Nadu IADVL Academy, so that we, are, we have already applied for the credit hours from Tamil Nadu Medical Council. So kindly mail or WhatsApp your uh, medical council number along with the state of registration. Thank you. Professor Thaddeus. The first uh, question will be, role of antibiotics in atopic dermatitis. Whether it is indicated as a must before starting therapy. Uh, Dr. Anandan here. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, during the course of lecture by Dr. Murli Rajagopal, uh, he very clearly mentioned that uh, atopic dermatitis skin is prone for staphylococcal infection and other type of bacterial infections. There is uh, 
a definite role of antibiotics because since there is a propensity for infections when there is no response no to topical corticosteroids or topical anti inflammatory agents we must consider infection and appropriate use of systemic antibiotics regarding the topical use of antibiotics it has been proposed that nasal carrier state in atopic dermatitis you can use either sodium fusidate or 2% mupirocin cream into the nose of these individuals of atopic dermatitis i think there is definite role of antibiotics in the management of atopic dermatitis thank you for so thank you for your uh, nice explanation uh, professor and, thadius may i just make a very very minor point yes sir uh, dr mudli dar here uh one good clinical marker we have for using antibiotics in atopic dermatitis is the presence of crusting uh, crusting invariably tells us that there is uh, colonization and uh, staph infection the second if you are going to use an antibiotic please do not use a very broad spectrum antibiotic otherwise there will be dysbiosis so mm. this is a double edged weapon when we are using antibiotics because if we produce dysbiosis and there is no staff for anything on the skin then the malassezia is going to take over and once malassezia takes over the dermatitis worsens much more sir i want to tell you one thing that is yes sir that i think there are many atopic dermatitis patients are treated empirically with the antibiotics for secondary skin infection and an understanding of uh, epidemiology of the bacterial colonization and super infection is essential for proper treatment of atopic dermatitis with bacterial cultures so we should do a bacterial culture nowadays there is an increasing of mrsa also mrsa infection mrsa mrsa so probably 90% of the skin is infected or colonized that should be a difference between the colonization of staphylococcus aureus and infection infection of the colony so there is a difference between these two so one bacterial culture is very important second other thing many people are using topical calcineurin inhibitors in conjunction with topical steroids so this is increasing the staphylococcus aureus colonization while topical antibiotic alone are useful to decrease the staphylococcus aureus infection and there is no clear clinical benefit because of the topical or systemic antibiotic treatment alone one one final point i want to tell here is antibiotic cocktails could be required to successfully treat skin colonization with staphylococcus aureus as we do in helicobacter pylori infections that's fine dr tarius yes sir yeah i would like to add a few a few points one is most of our patients indian patients they are coming out with a, like a, a classic atopic dermatitis may not be there but they complicate with so many topical turmeric and other agents so they 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 come in a colorful face and like <laughs> dr popal <laughs> and uh, dr anandan sir and they have clearly mentioned about uh, the role of uh, topical antibiotic and if it is very this is uh, infective eczematoid dermatitis that is a classical picture what we are seeing and i just suggest a topical emollients even the saline compress i first prefer before going for any antibiotic therapy because in atopic dermatitis even the normal looking cell non crested lesion cells so in 76 percentage of cases staph aureus may be the detected and in crested lesions 100 percentage and uh, naturally uh, and uh, you know in atopics uh, even dermatophyte and other things or uh, the, the titers are very high so uh, better uh, not to prefer the antibiotic as a first line so uh, whenever it is infective eczematoid dermatitis you just uh, try the topical the the solutions the different solutions even the sodium hypochlorite solution like a 6% uh, that is uh, once in a week or uh, twice a week and if you use and then we can reduce the colonization without giving much uh, disturbance and uh, uh, antibiotic resistance long term use of antibiotics definitely it is going to produce a lot of resistance and uh, we are already short of only the few uh, couple of topical as well as systemic antibiotics and i prefer the the dressing and other uh, uh, oatmeal bath like that so modification of therapy can improvise the the outcome so what will be the drug of uh, the antibiotic antibiotic sorry your voice is not clear uh, you uh, drug you will use your preference choice 
sir your voice is not clear like i said you your voice is not clear no he was asking what what would be the drug of choice or preference of your drug uh, drug choice for this uh, to, means uh, antibacterial drug of choice cephalosporin sir even the flu cloxacin and the topical mucosin fusiric acid and uh, 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 macrolide antibiotics like azithromycin roxithro clarithro all can be tried staphylococcus staphylococcal antibacterials can be used sir usually and dr ram sami sir usually uh, the antibodies are active against staph or yes there is uh, amoxicillin cloxacin cloxacin combination is enough for you okay so thank you sir thank you for the nice discussion we'll go on to the next uh, question sir does uh, diet really play a role in childhood atopic dermatitis uh who do you want to yeah, answer dr. yeah dr geeta rani madam is asking now who is this question for can anybody take it up we really do not know whether any diet uh, plays a role in that particular individual but uh, it is anybody, anybody to can avoid, take it sir. it's open so it is better to avoid uh, uh egg and animal protein and uh, peanuts and other uh, nuts uh, i feel uh, avoidance of food uh, until at least one or two years of uh, age is better the olden theory was that we are uh, uh, refusing to give egg and egg products chocolates peanuts all these are coming but i don't know how far it is true unless proved otherwise we can definitely give, keep giving this uh, egg and egg products uh professor tadius yes sir yeah uh, we did have a whole symposium on diet in uh, atopic dermatitis about 2 years ago when professor antius wallenberg had also come uh the best option is to uh, is to ask the mother if it's a very small child ask the mother to maintain a food diary and look for exacerbations there are no laboratory tests which can uh, uh give you a very clear uh, Uh, indication because even the so called fadia top assay which is being touted everywhere has only a negative predictive value not a positive predictive value so maintaining a food diary and correlating exacerbations with the food diary is easily the best method to go in for uh, dietary modification i also believe that uh, i agree that we should not go in for a blanket exclusion diet because then the child would suffer nutritionally okay sir so diet act, diet actually no restriction is required depending upon the allergy and the allergic reactions the patient develops we can modify the diet dr sir the next course yes sir you uh, one more and i think uh, food challenging because lot of parents they bring out with lot of allergy because the first question and what to uh, avoid so that is the one and uh, naturally if you just follow the traditional one they say the brinjal and uh, egg and if you just uh, stop all the drugs all the uh, the food nutritional the thing and uh, the uh, child will be landed up with uh, uh, nutrition malnutrition and growth retardation so like there some psychological that can also happen so uh, and if, if they strongly suspect and uh, the and uh, either practice and you have to just stop the particular uh, uh, drug for the food for uh, Two to four weeks, then re-challenge. So that is the one. They double blind, reach a, a placebo-controlled and a food challenge test. That is the one. That is gold standard. That can be uh, tried. So that, we don't have anything because we cannot simply follow the IgE level because there is a um, uh, it is it become a non-selective one and uh, it may be raised in many other conditions. So I I prefer the re-challenge if it is definitely there. Then uh, we we can avoid uh, uh, skip. and uh, such kind of thing to improve the outcome of atopic dermatitis i agree totally if uh, if we maintain a food diary and the mother comes and says that this is a suspected agent then you go for an exclusion of that food stuff and then you try a rechallenge after a washout period of 4 weeks 
I totally I agree completely with Dr. Kavi also. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. The next uh, we'll go on to the next question. Vaccination in uh, children, sir, in atopic children, what precautions uh, to be taken? So, what are the things to be followed while vaccinating a children? Because most often we have a reference from the pediatrician whether vaccination can be given to given to atopic children in the exacerbation phase or during the convalescence phase also. So, what I should I take done? up this question? Okay, sir. Yeah, this uh, the vaccination is a very interesting point here in atopic dermatitis. The one thing you should remember is the risk of not vaccinating outweigh the questionable risk of vaccine-induced allergy. There are many people who got allergy because of the vaccine. In that also, not exactly the vaccine itself causes the allergy, but the products which are the components of the vaccine like egg, yeast, or sometimes dextrons, or also the additives and the preservatives. These are the uh, things which are causing allergy for the atopic dermatitis. So in that case, we need not stop the vaccination and most of the vaccine these allergic uh, atopic children are not at all having any reaction for vaccination provided this live attenuated influenza vaccines should not be given that's what i understand and if the risk of vaccine is believed to outweigh the benefit of vaccination should not be administered for children yes whether the, the children have to be admi I mean, uh, admitted for a day in a daycare center Definitely. or at least for observation for six, uh, six hours like that for vaccination? Yes, with not, a very few exceptions. Not, yes, yes. Not, yes. Not necessary, sir. Uh, Dr. Anandan here. I had a discussion yes, with uh, one of our senior professor of pediatrics. There is no contraindication of vaccination in atopic children. However, the, like Dr. Srinivasan said, some of the components of the vaccines, like say egg containing vaccines, egg protein containing vaccine, gelatin, or aluminum chloride, some of the products they can produce allergy. So, like the pr basic protocol of vaccination to observe the children at least for a half to one hour after vaccination in the area of vaccination is mandatory. Because uh, you have to, in, in, because the risk of diseases in case you don't vaccinate is much higher rather than giving vaccination. The allergy, I went through an article where there is a immunization protocol in atopic children. There is no absolute contraindication of vaccinating atopic children. However, care must be taken to avoid, especially one of these aluminum salts containing, there can be nodules at the site of injection, which mm -hmm. have to be followed up. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice uh, explanation. In, uh, in Which, our country, uh, in our setup, uh, most of the children who have mild atopic uh, dermatitis, they get regular immunization and no reaction occurs and it goes unnoticed. The reference comes only when the children is have children is, children are having severe or not active skin lesions. In that case, as uh, sir told, it can be given under observation and uh, continued. Can I come inside? I'm Dr. Yeah, Anandan. Dr. Anandan Pidian. Uh, sir, good evening to all. And I'm a person who deal with atopic dermatitis as well as vaccinations together. So routinely, I don't hesitate to vaccinate a child with atopic dermatitis unless and otherwise the child is on immunosuppression like steroids or cyclosporins. Then I wean off the drug for about two weeks. Then you go for live activated vaccines. Then you can continue uh, the steroids post-vaccination. 48 hours post-vaccination, you can restart the drug. One. Number two, one, after vaccinating, I request them to stay back in my clinic for an hour or so if it is going to be the first vaccine, I mean the first shot. If it is going to be a DPT, something like that, it should have three shots with uh, four weeks apart. So if it is going to be a second shot, I don't ask them to wait. So I send them home. If it is going to be a first shot, I ask them to wait for about an hour or so. And I ask them to repeat, I mean, uh, call me after six hours after taking the vaccination by phone and tell me the situation of the child because late reactions can also occur in a child, what I have seen once. So this is in short about the vaccination of the children. Um, I mean, uh, this is in particular with the live attenuated vaccines. If it is going to be uh, uh, non-live vaccines, you can straight away go for vaccinations. There is no harm in doing it. Thank you, sir. So we'll go on to the next uh, question, sir. Which uh, NSAIDs will be safe 
in psoriatic arthritis without exacerbating the disease, sir. Well, when hello. Hello, I am yes, Dr. Ramaswamy. Hello. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. I'm yes, Dr. sir. I am Dr. Ramaswamy. I am taking up the question, sir. Actually, uh, NSAIDs. Uh, we usually we give uh, this uh, diclofenac and other things, sir. They don't exacerbate in our practice this uh, skin lesions. Okay. One more drug I want to mention here is sulfasalazine, sir. Sulfasalazine is commonly underused in psoriatic arthritis. I can say, sulfasalazine. We can use uh, that drug for uh, psoriatic arthritis, sir. NSAIDs we can use safely in psoriatic arthritis without exacerbating skin lesions, sir. In our experience. Okay. Any any other answers, sir? Sir, rheumatologists tend to use indomethacin as a drug of choice in psoriatic arthropathy. The conventional NSAIDs can exacerbate, but I think one of the drugs which has been found to be quite useful in psoriatic arthropathy is, of course, uh, indomethacin, either 25 milligram regular tablet or 75 milligram sustained release. However, yes, the usage of methotrexate and that disease-modifying aiding uh, drugs are more preferable. Say, apramilast or uh, methotrexate is better preferred as a treatment for psoriatic arthritis or if a patient can afford biologicals. Hmm. What's your Anything experience about sulfosalazine, sir? Sulfosalazine, other, other doctors, seniors, the experience with I think it is very less often used. I, had, I have not seen uh, a single patient who is on sulfosalazine. That is the problem. We don't, uh, probably we are not using it to the extent we should be using. Yes, uh, may I come yes. in here, please? As far as the uh, NSAID is a cons uh, sorry. No, you go ahead, madam. Uh, NSAID is, when it is used for a long period, it may uh, trigger uh, skin psoriasis or the, I mean, uh, psoriatic lesions. Uh, mm -hmm. Short period, I think it doesn't have any influence on the skin lesions. And as far as this uh, sulfur cells, in, uh, I have never seen uh, people using that for psoriatic arthritis, but I've seen cases of sulfur cells in, with dress syndrome coming to us. Mm -hmm. Of course, madam, that's okay. sulfur drug, madam. That, that might produce... That's uh, late, that late reaction. Okay. Okay, may I just... But I am, I am using it, madam, for a yeah. long period, okay. sulfur cellogen, with nice results, madam. Okay. Yeah, I would tend to agree with Dr. Ramasamy. I, I also use sulfur cellogen for my patients. I don't refer every single psoriasis patient to a rheumatologist for treating the arthropathy. If it's mild, I would use sulfur cellogen. Indomethacin, I agree totally with Dr. Anandan. It's a good drug. Uh, Celicoxib can also be used. Yes, Any experience with the naproxen, sir? I don't normally use naproxen because of the pronounced GI side effects. Okay, sir. sir I have Thank tried you, colchicin, sir. Colchicin is producing nice results. Sir. That disease modifying agent, sir. Okay. Colchicin, colchicin, hmm. sir. Okay, sir. So, if uh, we'll go to the next uh, question, sir. So, managing the psoriasis in uh, hepatic patients, what uh, drugs will uh, be preferring in uh, such conditions, sir? Hepatic uh, managing psoriasis in normal patients itself is uh, uh, difficult, uh, and we have to investigate and monitor for hepatic uh, functions. Sir. When the patient is already having compromised uh, hepatic function, it is difficult, it's really challenging. But most of the time when we investigate the patient, about 50% will be having abnormal ultrasound, mild fatty liver. But we don't uh, hesitate to use other conventional drugs in that case, provided LFT is normal. But when it is severe, we have to withhold or uh, we are uh, in a difficult situation. We cannot use methotrexate, acetretin or other things. But it depends on the uh, severity of the psoriasis also. If it is mild, well and good, topicals will be used. Moderate to severe, narrow band UVB can be used mm. or aprimolast in uh, moderate to severe or uh, erythrodomic psoriasis and all. But no. uh, other biologics, TNF, also they have hepatotoxic effect, even though etanacept is supposed to be less hepatotoxic and secukinumab, it is not hepatotoxic, but if the hepatic dysfunction is due to viral etiology, almost all these drugs uh, reactivate uh, hepatitis. I, uh, I'm sorry, but I beg to differ here. Yes. Uh, 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 going backwards, uh, I have been using biologics for my patients. 
And when you use a biologic, even if whether you're using an IL-17 blocker, even if the patient has latent hepatitis, uh, you can you have to give the uh, uh, anticabir first and then treat. I have several patients who have got hepatitis B or hepatitis C, and they're being managed extremely well with secacudumab. We should not hesitate to use an IL-17 blocker just because there is hepatitis B or C. There is a protocol for managing these patients, and there is a protocol for how to monitor them, number one. Number two, when it comes to hepatitis C, if the patient has hepatitis C, then actually a TNF-alpha blocker may help because TNF-alpha blockers actually help in the body getting rid of hepatitis C virus. So one should not hesitate to use a TNF-alpha blocker if you have proved that it's hepatitis C. The problem arises when a patient has this so-called mild fatty liver. The problem is that most people ignore that mild fatty liver, do not investigate further. Mild fatty liver could very well be NASH. The mild fatty liver, if you do, if you do a fibro scan, you would find that there would be definite fibrosis also in some of them. Even a psoriasis patient, knife to methotrexate or any hepatotoxic drug, either biological non or non-biological, can go into NASH as a, a, a complication of the disease itself. So in such patients, it is worthwhile to treat these patients. I do agree that if a patient has NASH, I would not exhibit a drug like methotrexate or acetretin, but biologics definitely are useful. And we have studies, publications, which show that the NASH can even be reversed. So I don't think there is any room for doubt over here. The guidelines are very clear. So do you use sikikinumab or other biologics, sir? I use sekekinumab most widely because it is very safe. And yes. uh, if, okay. if, if the, uh, if the uh, as far as TNF alpha blockers are concerned, the, the, the other uh, 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 problem we face is that we say there's a mild rise in liver enzymes so we can manage. I don't think that holds true in real life situations because in real life situations, even if there's a mild rise in liver enzymes, you look at the, uh, the fibro scan, you will find that there is significant liver damage. So rise in liver enzymes is not an indicator of the severity of liver damage. So I, I would not like to use a TNF alpha blocker if there is no hepatitis C, uh, because TNF alpha blockers, as rightly pointed out by Dr. Geeta, are by themselves hepatotoxic. But uh, I am more uh, happier to use a drug like an IL-17 blocker. Sir, what's yes, the role of cyclosporin? Cyclosporin, uh, cyclosporin in short courses can be used even if there is NASH. But if there is hepatitis, uh, if there is infection, then you need to uh, cover the infection before you start treatment with cyclosporin. Okay. Sir. Yeah, cyclosporin and mycophenidate mofetil is another choice. Okay, uh, I have talked to medical gastroenterologists. Induction by Mycophenate mofetil also is not a contraindication in presence of mild liver damage. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice discussion. The next question will be managing unstable psoriasis. Sir, here unstable means uh, steroid uh, withdrawal, no? Ah, whether steroid the patient withdrawal. will be going in for erythroderma or yeah, metabolic complications like that. Yes, sir. sir, we see a law, large number of cases treated by GPs. They give systemic steroids. While they stop steroids, it will go in for erythroderma and it becomes positive psoriasis. I used to manage with the first with cyclosporin, sir, in a high dose like 100 to 200 mm -hmm. mg per day. Then I will go in for other drugs like uh, uh, methotrexate and all, usually in our practice. Cyclosporin is a nice drug. It is commonly uh, with less side effects for a short period. Okay. Sir. Other supine. Hello? Yes, sir. It's better, it's better to avoid systemic steroids in any uh, type of uh, this unstable psoriasis. We shouldn't uh, use systemic steroids, sir. Okay, sir. I think one other thing that we should not do in unstable psoriasis is give the patient phototherapy. I've seen patients who have been put on phototherapy with unstable psoriasis coming to me with erythroderma after that. Mm -hmm. Phototherapy can push your patient into erythroderma. Okay, sir. 
What about acetatin in these cases, sir? Anybody used? Acetatin, acetatin takes too long. That's the whole problem. Right. For benefit to be seen, it takes too long. Aprimilus is not that very effective either in arthritis or even in uh, plaque psoriasis. Only th it takes months to be even 20 to 30 percent effective. It is used only for mild disease, if at all. So I wouldn't use acetretin. I wouldn't use ap uh, aprimilus. I don't mind using cyclosporin. It's a beautiful drug. As I told you, it's a favorite drug for me. It's a good drug. I wouldn't mind combining cyclosporin uh, along with even a biological initially and take off the cyclosporin fast. Okay, sir, we'll uh, progress to the... Dr. Tadeus, uh, there was a question from the attendees. How do you manage psoriatic erythroderma during first trimester of pregnancy? I think uh, the yes, question is about sir, that. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to add it in the, I mean, uh, yes, sir, we'll discuss that first. Management of uh, psoriasis in uh, early pregnancy. Which drugs will, can be used? In early pregnancy, it would be better not to use cyclosporin or methotrexate or acetretin. No doubt about all that because early pregnancy, I'm assuming uh, three months. So three months organogenesis, we would like to try and avoid as much as possible. If it is stable, phototherapy is a very good option, even in pregnancy. Of course, now we have trials which say that cyclokinumab is a safer drug in pregnancy. If we had uh, uh, access to Semzia, that is uh, 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 sertolizumab pegol, then we could use that. Okay, sir. And we'll uh, move on to the next question. Approach to a psoriasis patient who is coming back from alternative medicine treatment, probably steroids, heavy metals, and uh, drugs which may, we may not be knowing. This is common in uh, south part of Tamil Nadu. Alternative medicine, and uh, even in alternate, when they go to alternative medicine, steroid is given in a masked uh, uh, form and they are not aware that they have been given steroid. And the management of uh, uh, patients who have been on steroid is uh, something different. They usually come with uh, um, uh, erythrodomic psoriasis or pustular psoriasis with cushingoid features, uh, steroid dependency, and HP axis suppression. So we have to consider all these facts. And steroid, when they have been on long term, it is difficult to withdraw and it's not prudent to abruptly stop the steroid also. Depending on how much the dose she was on or the patient was on, we can slowly taper and by the time we can evaluate the patient and start her on conventional anti psoriatic drug also. And uh, sometimes uh, not only systemic or oral steroid, topical steroid also, potent steroid applied for a long period and over a large area, that also produced pushing white syndrome. Presence mm -hmm. of pushing white uh, features itself is a clinical suggestion that the patient is uh, having HPA suppression. So in that case, case also, even though we can stop topical steroid, but a small dose of uh, systemic steroid we can give and start on uh, anti-steroidic treatment. I so have, I have the, uh, see, there are two issues over here. One is the steroids and second is the heavy metal. Uh, we have to make, we have to understand that sometimes heavy metals uh, damage the kidneys. So we have to look at the renal functions. And when you look at a question like approach, then you have to evaluate the HP axis. You have to look at the ACTH, you have to look at the cortisol. If necessary, do even a dexamethasone suppression test because uh, we need to know whether the, AC, uh, the HP axis is functional or not. If the, uh, if, if the HP axis is functional, then you can safely withdraw steroids gradually. But uh, the best way to withdraw steroids is bring it down to the minimum possible dose as far as prednisolone is concerned, and then go to something like uh, uh, fludrocortisone, which you can use as one milligram tablets or one milligram of prednisolone can be used to gradually taper off and keep monitoring the HP axis. Once the HP axis, the ACTH levels are high enough, generally I look at a level of 30 to 35. Once we know that it comes up to that level, we know that even if you stop the steroid, the body is going to produce endogenous steroids on its own. 
At the same time, we'll have to treat the patient's psoriasis also. So you can introduce, depending upon the type of psoriasis the patient has, you can introduce any of the treatments that you standardly would recommend for a psoriasis patient. But one thing we should not do in patients who have uh, been on steroids and are, are taking steroids, once again, avoid phototherapy because we the steroid will be masking the unstable nature of the psoriasis. Another thing with alternative medicine, sometimes the picture is uh, completely altered. The skin lesion doesn't look like a dry skin uh, erythrodermic uh, psoriasis at all. It looks like eczematous uh, uh, erythrodoma. And the skin is uh, eczema, eczematous and the patient is sick uh, with uh, all facial edema and other things. In that situation, we need to get steroid to come out of that uh, um, uh, crisis uh, and uh, evaluate the patient. <laughs> Right. Sir, I would like ah, to add. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Goodness, sir. For, no, because most of the patients actually, uh, we have to counsel the patient. That is, I feel it is more important because all the alternative medicine people they use steroid and they produce rapid uh, effect. And, and if just if you want to uh, just switch over to allopathy, and one is the economy concern, and they have to explain the the long term uh, uh, treatment, and we need to taper. And sometimes some uh, some fluctuations of the disease, exacerbation, remission, all those things, and some side effects of all the allopathy drugs, all the things should be done. We believe that uh, all the alternative medicine is safer when compared to allopathy. And even a lot of uh, uh, patients who develop the complication, like uh, uh, I just have seen many cases of renal uh, impairment, that is the one, and as well as the hepatic uh, uh, liver failure cases, and they presented with the uh, actress and uh, renal failure, and all the pushing head features and in a deadline. So those patients are not projected. And I think even our people also, they're not projected. These are the thing. There is no much of studies on this. And this has to be taken in a large scale. And, uh, I would like to stress, we have to counsel the patient and it will take some time. The barrier uh, repairing and you have to wait for assess the disease severity. Then accordingly, one by one, you have to just, uh, if you just uh, treat and I think uh, the, the outcome may be better even with the ordinary things. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And the uh, next uh, question will be, are we forgetting conventional therapy for psoriasis, like uh, coltar and uh, dithranol? Nowadays, it is not uh, used at all. But you've also written that which are said to induce long-lasting long remission. Remission, yes, sir. Are we, are we serious about that? <laughs> I'm not serious. I just want to discuss with you all. That's all. Well, I don't know. The problem is I don't think it induces remission. Uh, there's no drug which induces remission and least of all coal tar and dithranol. And uh, I personally don't advise coal tar. But sometimes in palmar psoriasis, short contact dithranol therapy is useful. And uh, that is the only uh, place for uh, uh, tar derivatives. Okay, uh, I use uh, coal tar in palmer plant psoriasis. There are some preparations where moisturizers with coal tar is available. So patients are quite happy using moisturizer with coal tar in palmer plant lesions and quite effective. Mm -hmm. So do you do you prefer coal tar over dithranol for palmer plant psoriasis? I prefer because dithranol irritation is quite. Uh, no, that's why that's why I talked about short contact. Short contact. You know, however therapy. much we try to explain to the patients, no, they yeah. don't follow the instructions. That's a problem. <laughs> okay. Coltar with salicylic acid preparation is useful, sir, for uh, chronic block type lichenified psoriasis. Sir. Hmm. There is a preparation with coltar and the topical steroids, madam. Is it uh, useful? Have you ever tried? Coltar and uh, topical steroid combination. Oh. That definitely steroid will work, sir, more than coltar. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> <I'm wrong then. laughs> uh, moderator, okay. with your permission, one question on this topic. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I am Dr. Nirmala. Uh, sir, uh, how about the use of coltar shampoos? Because it is mainly available as shampoo, if I yeah. know. Yeah. Because the lotion is very minimal. Uh, so, how about its use in scalp psoriasis? I think there it is most of the time used. Uh, yeah, yes. Scalp psoriasis, coal tar uh, is very useful. Hmm. Coal tar with 2% ketoconazole shampoos are available. 
and uh, since we know that scalp psoriasis can be colonized by malassezia usage of cold tar with 2% ketoconazole is quite useful i use it uh, regularly in psoriatic scalp patients yes, i, I also uh, prefer does it to produce use any folliculitis sir yeah some patients do have irritation some patients don't like the smell of cold tar mm -hmm. few patients complain of folliculitis no i think the folliculitis irritation and all depends upon the formulation there is one formulation mm -hmm. there is one formulation which doesn't produce irritation or or folliculitis mm -hmm. and uh, and in fact that does not even have the smell of cold tar it's transparent it's called avenzia i find that very useful and i find it uh, useful more for maintaining the scalp because uh, it doesn't actually make the plaques disappear none of the cold tar preparation makes a plaque disappear to make the plaque disappear you will need to use a steroid foam or a steroid lotion uh, one of the two you'll have to use what's But the trend in long term in... maintenance with the tar shampoo is excellent i agree on that point what's the trend in trend name it's called avenzia okay Doctor, that is with your permission. There is a yes, question sir. about uh, this uh, novel preparation of uh, clobetazole propionate, point zero two five percent. Does it is it uh, like uh, the panelists? Do they have any experience about it? Uh, is it really beneficial compared to the conventional point five percent clobetazole propionate? i would say that uh, clobetazol propionate in any concentration is the same i would like like to avoid clobetazol propionate in patients i know that this thing has come up they call it a novel preparation it comes as a foam also but i think it is a little dicey to get our patients uh, hooked on to clobetazol like i had Doctor, that is you. And yes, sir. Right, sir. One of them. And the one is uh, once you uh, steroid in any form, whether low concentration, high concentration. As sir said, once it uh, it is steroid means like once you stop, there is a rebound uh, thing, and it is going to respond only to the steroid, but it is not responding to other. True. Things. Yeah. Bef before going that, you can use some uh, uh, vitamin D derivative and the combination therapy. Like uh, like exposed to uh, sun like UVB and uh, with uh, calcitriol, even calcitriol and tacalcitriol, which irritates lesser than the calcipotriol. So uh, so we can use such kind of combination before uh, using the steroid. Okay. So we'll uh, move on to the next uh, question, sir. Metabolic syndrome impact on uh, psoriasis management. One of the audience have also asked uh, which drug uh, you prefer in. Uh, Diabetic patients. It works both ways. Psoriasis can produce the metabolic syndrome, and the metabolic syndrome by itself makes psoriasis that much more difficult to treat. And usually, metabolic syndrome is associated with NASH and insulin resistance, both of which worsen the prognosis of psoriasis. so that would be the impact of metabolic syndrome on psoriasis management and this is the reason why psoriasis management is never complete unless and until lifestyle management is brought in so the metabolic syndrome needs to be reversed in patients who have psoriasis otherwise they won't respond to their medications in fact some of the medications especially the early tnf alpha blockers like infliximab can worsen the metabolic syndrome they can produce a lot of weight gain and the metabolic syndrome can worsen so we need to make it clear to patients that they need to lose weight and they need to get into a fitness program control the diet and, and uh, therefore you will be able to even see the beneficial effects on the uh, fibro scans when you do it in the liver but as far as psoriasis management in a patient with metabolic syndrome is concerned mm -hmm. the only thing is i will avoid a hepatotoxic drug if the patient has hypertension i'll i won't avoid cyclosporine just because the patient is hypertensive so long as the bp is kept under good control but we will minimize the ex exposure to cyclosporine but this is an ideal situation for the use of a biologic so one of the audience have asked uh, which drug we have to use in a patient with uh, diabetes antipsoriatic drug which can be used in diabetes 
once without again, any complication. Once again, psoriasis by itself produces diabetes. And you can use any of the drugs except, of course, steroids in a patient of psoriasis with diabetes. It doesn't matter much. So long as diabetes is not part of the metabolic syndrome. <coughs> Sir, uh, Dr. Tade, you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I would like to add even uh, pioglitazone and uh, simvastatin and uh, even uh, uh, this metformin. So all those ca can be used. But uh, the, the problem is uh, when the patient is having metabolic syndrome, they have a lot of other components like uh, the uh, uh, resistant type of psoriasis and uh, flexural psoriasis uh, and uh, uh, what is it? Poor response to all the, all the agents. And as the sir said, and first you have to uh, educate the patient to lifestyle modification, to just uh, bring back the body weight and uh, uh, dyslipidemia management. And otherwise, it is going to uh, be a recurrent problem. And even the flexures, we have a lot of issues. So uh, metabolic syndrome, met metformin, and uh, even simvastatin, so can be combined with the uh, uh, anti measures. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. One and, observation uh, is... Uh, that yes, is, madam. Yes, madam. One, one, my one observation is Aprimilast is uh, be, works better in obese and diabetic patients to some extent mm -hmm. compared to lean individuals. Okay. And one, one more question. Side from, effects uh, of, yes, sir. One of the yes, side sir, effects of Aprimilast is reduction of BMI. Hmm. I think uh, when we talk about uh, uh, Aprimilast reducing the BMI, uh, it does produce a certain degree of loss of weight, but we should remember that the reduction of more than 10% uh, of body weight with Aprimilast is a contraindication to continuing Aprimilast. Yeah, yes, yes, Dr. Mordida. And one of the questions asked by the audience is that a psoriasis patient who is on biologicals is becoming COVID positive. Whether you will be continuing biologicals or uh, you'll wait and when I, to be readmitted. Hmm. I will continue. Continue. It yeah, make today a morning difference. I delivered a lecture, psoriasis in COVID scenario. There is no contraindication for stopping uh, biological during COVID positivity. Okay, so biologicals can be continued. Continued, yes. yeah. Continued and there is no contraindication for biologicals in yeah. COVID situation. Yes. It may okay, actually so. help. Uh, Professor Thaddeus, actually, it may help. Yes, sir. Because IL-17 uh, is the agent which produces cardiac morbidity in COVID. That will be suppressed. That can be blocked by using a biological. And TNF-alpha is also released uh, on infection by the, by the viral cells. So either of the biologicals can be used. There is and it is doubly so beneficial. <laughs> exactly. And there is a so protect registry now where we are monitoring patients of uh, psoriasis uh, in the COVID age uh, who are on treatment uh, with COVID or without COVID. We have more than 550 patients as of now uh, in the register and none of them have worsened. Uh, all of them are stable in spite of being treated with the entire variety of biologicals around the world. Okay, sir. thank you, sir. And uh, the last question, management of uh, post lichen planus pigmentation or post inflammatory pigmentation due to lichen planus. There is no specific treatment for the post inflammatory pigmentation following lichen planus. I think we'll have to wait and watch. It's easier to prevent earlier treating with cyclosporin oh. or steroid for a short period. That is easier before even the pigmentation occurs. If you know the pathology, everybody knows it is very difficult to treat lichen planus pigmentation. The melanin goes, drops down into the dermis, where you have no medicine will go and act, including lasers. Mm -hmm. So the patient has to be convinced and the prognosis should be explained and reassured. We had a, 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 a Professor Thaddeus, we had a meeting. I think Dr. Maya will, will uh, recollect. We did have a meeting some time ago in some other forum where somebody showed us fabulous results with the Q-switch NDA laser. Uh, Dr. Maya, do you remember that? They showed us very good results. Yeah, yeah we had um, the in the in uh, in Mumbai chapter, IADville, Mumbai yeah. chapter on lichen pain is just last week. And uh, they said uh, that you could prevent, as uh, Dr. Geetarani said, uh, giving adequate doses of cyclosporin. 
you can actually prevent the post inflammatory hyperpigmentation but after the uh, pigmentation has set in only lasers can help and and i think they they showed very good results with q switch lasers yes dr sushil tahiliani showed his case yes exactly dr sushil was the one who showed us a good number of cases it was very yes. impressive and uh, that was the last question and uh, there are no more questions from the audience so with this i thank the organizers and the panelists who have had a nice uh, discussion this evening and thank you so much sir thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank, thank you thank you everybody thank you dr maya and dr anandan it was very thank very you. nice thank you so much very enriching so thank you hope to see all of you every month Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you. Good night. Sir, Dr. Nepa, Dr. V. Anandan, and our moderator, Dr. Tadiyas, and Annie, and thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you for thank the organizers. Thank you, all the organizers. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Murli. Bye, Dr. Tadiyas. Thank you, Dr. Tadiyas, for moderating the session. And it was, uh, even though we had... Uh, exceeded our time by more than 40 minutes it was very interesting and useful for the audience once again at last dr tadeez has shown his face thank you sir i know thanks dr tadeez <laughs> thank so much thanks for the wonderful panel <coughs> <laughs> yes thank you thank you madam with all the cooperation it went on very well now i request thank you, thank you tadeez sir thank you sir dr maya request... was next on the cards Tell us, Murli. Give us ideas. That You're was the boss. That was my request. <laughs> You're no, the no, boss no. of IADV. I'm just a facilitator. <laughs> now, now I request. You're uh, listening to my speech. And I am yeah. happy. I am happy to tell that even though we are uh, we have exceeded our time by forty minutes, still we have two hundred and fifty attendees interestingly attending the session. I'm really grateful to you. Grateful to, to them. All of them. and i am grateful to the panelists for keeping that uh, session very lively once again thanks all the panelists now i request dr nirmala devi immediate past president and co chairperson of iarevil tn academy for a formal vote of thanks and before that i'll also like to thank dr ani the convener for helping me out in organizing I mean, this event this is going to be as dr murlidhar was asking this is going to be a monthly program and uh, dr maya has very very uh, sort of uh, grand plans ahead so uh, sir i will i just want to add few words only thing is uh, this was uh, dr nirmala's brain child this academy uh, starting and everything she was the one who put her first step forward and she started it and uh, dr anandan is always there for telling this has to be done this way these are the protocols that is how things will come right that is how it will be perfect all these things by dr anandan dr maya she is very very enthusiastic ever since she became the president she is like uh, i want to do lot of things lot of academic activities for all our members and all, uh, like i i'm not giving a vote of thanks or anything but i just wanted to say a few things so the aim of our academy was to take knowledge to all of our members and the whole team has done a wonderful job because everyone gets the academics but the people behind it have to be made known to all of them who are seeing this and um, about uh, dr kavierson he literally he called me the other day he gave certain he gave a lot of inputs like what things i could have missed in arranging all these things and uh, if anything has gone amiss it would be my mistake i would like to take it because all of you have given all your inputs to make this really a good success and um, uh, dr padmanandan he is taking care of all the tech support and everything like uh, and our panelists i definitely have to say because i've been bugging them here and they're calling them Uh, at odd hours but still they have been helpful they have sent all their details everything so i would like to thank them also and as part of our academy i would like to tell all our uh, uh, audience that it is only your motivation which will actually help us go forward so please continue attending like this so that we will arrange more programs and uh, dr nirmala because she is going to say the vote of thanks but who will thank her for having done her job she is the one who started it so really thanks to you dr nirmala over to you madam And the credit points, yeah. Annie. You tried yeah. for the credit points. You have to say that. Ah yes, 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 yes. The credit uh, points really took Annie a lot of time. Lot of work. 
we had uh, we had uh, uh, dr uh, ravi shankar of uh, our ima past president he put in a lot of like uh, our things were getting uh, delayed which he helped us overcome which he helped us really uh, cross that so i think we have moved forward we will be getting our credit points and i'm thankful to a lot of people for helping me with that can i speak now please yes sir dr shrinivasan yes sir. we should not forget the united states person Yes, sir. Yes, yes. 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 Sir, I am going to thank everybody now. <laughs> Madam is going to thank. So I am thanking Madam. I, I need some space for thanking. Please, <laughs> please give, please give of my immediate past president the <laughs> space to thank everybody. <laughs> Um, a few persons are still left. <laughs> and, uh, yes, I just Sorry want to mention that doctors Reddy's are have committed Hi. to help us in organize these functions throughout the year. This is not a thanking them. I'm just recognizing their uh, this thing. They have helped. They have committed to help us in organizing these programs. As Dr. Annie said, it's only the team Tamil Nadu AADVL. They should motivate us. They should demand more from us so that we can come out with more number of these programs and uh, with the guidance of uh, uh, past presidents like Dr. Anandan sir, Dr. Nirmala, Dr. Maya. Dr. Uh, Srinivasan sir and so many people are ready to work for you and uh, as a field worker I am ready to contribute my this thing in organizing these things. Now it's over to Dr. Nirmala Devi for formal vote of thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, to tell the vote of thanks in a coordinated and formal way. So I should first thank Maya ma'am for her enthusiasm and energy <laughs> to hold such uh, what to say in a extravagant CME, in fact, uh, today we had and uh, everybody were uh, energetic till the end. And uh, thanks for arranging, ma'am, Dr. Jashin Wu from Irvin, USA, because he was uh, telling, he covered all the topics, I mean, all the areas of psoriasis with the comorbidities and other things that was useful. And he stuck to the uh, timing also. Thank you. And uh, I should uh, thank Anandan sir for giving the good uh, uh, introduction and the welcome address. And uh, I thank uh, uh, Murli Dhar sir for uh, for talking about the management of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis across the ages. Actually, originally I meant the different age groups, but then sir covered both different age groups as well as the time. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that was good sir. And you covered all the basic aspects also, the rationality aspects. And we look forward to the newer drugs, the role of uh, uh, the this one, Jack inhibitors as well as the dupilumab. But still we are a poor country. We are still relying on the cyclosporin, steer, topical steroids, and uh, moisturizers, uh, always the green drug. And also the uh, azathioprine in adults, which you said. So we'll remember those things with the cyclosporin as a crisis buster. Okay. That word uh, I, from VRJ, ma'am, crisis buster, that word we'll never forget <laughs> in all diseases. And then uh, I should tell, uh, I thank Dr. Uh, Tadei sir for moderating the good session on management of eczema and papillosquamous disorders in Indian scenario and you had uh, constructed nice questions sir uh, in fact they are all very practical and more difficult to answer in fact uh, instead of just routine questions so I am thankful to you sir for those questions and I should thank immensely the all the panelists Dr. Anandan sir from SRMC as well as Professor M.S. Srinivasan sir Chetinadu, Dr. Geetha Rani ma'am from Madhuri Medical College, P.K.K. Kavir Sin sir from Chidambaram and Dr. Ramasamy sir from Tirupur, along with them, Dr. Murli Desar. So you had shared immensely the, your, the wholehearted experience with open heart uh, you shared with everybody. So that was very useful. And uh, I should also, th I, I, this may be the last, but that, that uh, it's not the least because Dr. Padmanandan and Annie Flora, most of them, I will be bugging them. Uh, Padmanandan many of the times and Annie will be going on putting the messages. Uh, so she'll promptly uh, remind everybody to do the work. And uh, for all the designing work and the background and techie work, uh, I should thank Padmanandan. And I should thank Annie for the arrangements, all the, uh, what to say, communications and the accreditation works, Annie. And you are, uh, you have a lot of, uh, what to say, bright days ahead. Uh, you are enthusiastic and energetic, sticking to the time. So you have bright days ahead. And I, I should, even though it is my brainchild, it is taking its shape only now because uh, this is the right time uh, and with the presence of Maya, enthusiastic Maya ma'am. So we will have many more such CMEs and uh, what I want to say is here, I think we should have create one feedback loop from the audience uh, because after the CME, after what of thanks, we are not able to hear much from them. So we'll create one feedback loop. This is for the audience uh, sake, I'm telling this. 
and another thing uh, we'll we can ma'am please you, you can formally ask uh, about the juniors many of them may be having their own uh, academic interest because at the end of the day whatever we discuss whether it is uh, aesthetic or this and that pigment but this academic forum will only make us uh, more enthusiastic and it is a bread and butter of everyday life for us because other things are laid, uh, very small so that is why the reason for starting this academy and thanks any for all those nice words but then it is a group work always it's a team work and all our present uh, executive committee is doing wonderful job so let's continue to do it and uh, anybody can send your uh, feedback to the academy and uh, as well as secretary and president to improve this uh, kind of uh, academic works so we'll create one feedback loop that padman and then uh, yes, yeah to get to opinion from the juniors and also ask uh, the juniors who are all want to contribute the cme as a speaker like that and the other forms thank you thank you for giving me this opportunity and we'll have many more such cmes thank you all good night thank you thank you good night thank you thank you good night good thank night everybody. good night everybody thank, thank you and you know, yeah. good night Once so, again, yeah, thank Dr. Reddy's for providing the. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I forgot to tell. Huh? Uh, Reddy's, <laughs> he's uh, they have been doing it for since last year. Uh, very sorry, it's not it was just uh, oversight. <laughs> Murli, give us some topics and speakers. I'll I'll, I'll 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 message it to you. Yeah, one international speaker every month. We thought one international, one Indian, and uh, a panel. So it will cover. Yes, ma'am. We have that uh, special focus groups, no, ma'am. Hmm. We have special focus groups, no, in the academy. We have decided. Yeah, that's uh, for Dr. Anand. Yeah, after deciding the uh, topic, okay. then we will send over the topic can to other. Stop the live streaming, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. You can stop. Who? Vishnu, you can stop the live streaming, I think. Yes, sir. How to get the feedback uh, form should be circulated in that same. Um, uh, registration link or we can put it in the website or the nobody will look into the website so what uh, maybe mail address only shall we create no, the same link, link that whatsapp dr nirmala the whatsapp group is quite big enough uh, if you feel it is not big enough then we can migrate to telegram because yeah, in telegram you what, can what is the what, number of the what, accommodation that's in what the telegram can accommodate 10000 telegram, telegram there is no limit for number 10000 hmm. people thing is only thing is instead of whatsapp we can have a single group where we can accommodate all the life members in a yes. single group and mm -hmm. we can have another group where we can have both the life members and the provisional life members so that communicating will also be easy instead of sharing yes. in multiple groups mm -hmm. communication will be easy as dr nirmala devi was telling feedbacks or suggestions or anybody interested in giving a talk mm -hmm. all the things can right. be in a single on a single platform so today i'll uh, start form i'll form a group i'll invite as many as many people as possible thing is they should uh, download the telegram this thing if we popularize it it will be easy for us and uh, telegram is fully encrypted mm. it's better than whatsapp as far as security is concerned it's fully encrypted until we don't commit any heinous crimes <laughs> <laughs> i didn't say that <laughs> uh, like can we upload the photos and video as the photos everything. You know, Telegram. Than you can put, uh, you, you can put PDF files also in Telegram. It's better than WhatsApp, ma'am. Mm. Much better. Then you can ask them for topics and uh, 